2. Killing Time The communal centre was alive with drunken inmates from every corner of the western galaxies. It was a large hangar sized building with three levels and was large enough to comfortably accommodate more than 1,300 convicts. Upon entering at the ground floor was the main bar where drinks tokens could be exchanged for one of three types of beverage. There was the beer, you could get two for a token, it was a nameless, flavourless liquid that couldn't get a nap pissed. Then there was the Icerian cider at a price of one token. A cider made from icer apples. Probably the foulest and most bitter apples the galaxy has to offer. But they are cheap and make a sour and highly potent alcoholic drink. Finally, everyone's favourite paint stripper, Cray Gin. A crystal clear gin made of fermented crayberries. Incidentally, the inmates drink of choice at two tokens per bottle. Past the bar on the ground floor was the first of many games rooms. This one simply a load of tables spaced out, where communal drinkers sat and happily gambled with cards, generally for drinks tokens, drugs and cigarettes, as these were the only items within the compound. There were three elevators, one on each of the three remaining side walls. Two were out of order, one was dodgy and had made a good makeshift toilet for many inmates, so mostly they used the stairs at either side. On the first floor you could find the gym, next to that the VR lounge, for all inmates escapers and needs, with a healthy collection of games and scenarios once again donated by the wardens. The top level was split into two large rooms, the broadcast room which was designated to movies and general broadcasts such as sports or news, and the mess hall where the inmates would congregate four times a day for their meals. Beyond that, in a tiny room that also doubled as a broom cupboard, was the one room that most of the inmates had never ventured into, and that was the chapel. There weren't many devout churchgoers here, but there were some, and this was their designated space of worship. Merely an afterthought, but a legal obligation. Of the various religions across the galaxy, it was the Church of David Icke that was the most prominent in this corner of the western galaxies. Brent Lagwater sat alone at a table in the empty broadcast room swigging on his bottle of Cray Gin whilst watching an appalling game of Zero Gravity Vortex Ball in which his home team, the Marcellus Angels, were competing. The Angels was a fitting name for a team that died every time they were on the pitch. This game was no exception. Currently the Angels were losing 25 to 82 to 40 in four quads with two slays left to play against the Nicerian forebearers that was the one team that the Angels should have been able to beat. It was sickening to watch. Brent swigged hard on his Cray Gin. It tasted like defeat. The other inmates would ridicule Brent for watching, let alone for supporting such an abysmal team, which he would usually take in good humour before a game, but very badly after one. They were a travesty of a team, but they were his team. He had to support them, had to believe that this time they would win. With just minutes to go, the game was as good as over. Brent took up the bottle, drained the final tenth and threw its empty carcass at the monitor wall. It exploded right across the screen with satisfying ferocity and the shards seemed to twinkle musically to the floor. He threw his large chest forward, hung his head back and roared, which, even over the sound of the coarse weather hammering against the tin building, the drinkers and gamblers down on the ground floor heard recognised instantly as Brent's loss and cheered ceremoniously before breaking into fits of laughter. Ashamed, angered and betrayed by his team, Brent made his way down to the ground floor, squeezing his way through the witty remarks and the all too familiar jokes until he reached his friend, cohort and literal partner in crime, Clavlin Hoper. He was deep into a game of New World Poker with one of the guards, Simon Hardy, a free-eyed humanoid of Genelti's descent. 
New World Poker was a card game that had been developed from an ancient game named Poker, which, legend has it, mankind used to play a lot of back in the days before they worked out how to get off that small blue planet. They say that they used to play with a 52 card deck back then, as opposed to the 64 card deck that Clav and his free-eyed opponent were playing with now. Back in the old days it had been the three royal cards which were the highest, and then the ace in certain games. They never even had the clandestine cards then, the mason, the illuminatus and the overlord. Today we find it hard to imagine how the various games would have worked out without their advantageous benefits. Hey Clav, Brent said solemnly. He slumped into the seat next to his pal and took a glance at his friend's cards. Good hand, he thought. He only had to look at the guard sat opposite Clav to see that his hand wasn't so good. His free eyes desperately flitted over the seven cards as though dancing over them continuously would eventually throw up a good hand. How's it going, buddy? Clav asked with the joviality of someone who was about to take someone else to the cleaners. Shit, Brent replied instantly. I really thought they'd beat the forebearers, man. I mean, the f***ing forebearers. Unbelievable. Well, I've told you why it is, Clav declared. I've got a ship manager. Same and simple. Plain and simple, Brett corrected. That's what I said. Same and simple. Plain and simple. That's what I said. They're never going to win a game with a f***ing well kaji ribbiting orders to the team. Ribbiting? Simon asked, obviously offended by Clavelin's reference to the well kaji species being somewhat amphibious and frog-like. No one can ever win with a Welkaji as their manager, Clav continued. I don't mean to sound speciesist, but Welkajis are the shittest species there are. Thick as shit and disgusting. I hate them. But you're not being speciesist, the free-eyed guard inquired sarcastically. No, I said that, didn't I? Well, yeah, but then you... Exactly, I said it. I'm not a speciesist, he said, before adding. You free-eyed dick. The guard merely retaliated by glaring at Clav with an angered look of distaste for a full 30 seconds before giving up when he was aware that Clav wasn't actually going to notice him. As soon as he released the scalding glare from his face, Clav looked up and blurted, Well come on you f***ing dick, it's your lay. What are you doing? Clumsily the guard twitched and jittered whilst he straightened his hand out, rearranged his cards and laid them face up on the table. He cleared his throat and looked up at Clav for approval or any sign of defeat to whittle across his brow. Only a look of complete contempt and disbelief was returned. Had he finally beaten his New World poker rival? Was that look of disbelief fuelled by defeat? Could it really be? That, Clav asked. The guard nervously smiled with an artificial confidence. He knew that the smile would be short-lived and soon to be wiped clean from his face. A single nod replied the single-syllable word that Simon didn't quite know how to voice at this moment. What the f*** is that? What are you going to win with that? I'm not even going to bother showing you my hand because yours is so shit. Clav laughed. Idiot. Finally, Simon had got a pair. After all this time, it wasn't much, but it was something at least. Better than the feeble and apparently not even a run of Jack Mason and Overlord he had in his last hand. Just three high cards with no collection, Clavid explained. This was better than an Overlord high. It was a pair, and still it was worthless, and yet again he was laughed off the table, whilst Clavelin swept up the accumulated drinks tokens between them and rose to leave. Simon nearly had this game nailed, he was sure. With just one more game he could beat Clavelin Hoper for once and for all. He was 99.9% .9 sure of it. Double or quits, he blurted dumbly. What? Clav and Brent asked in unison. Double or quits, Simon added, squaring up to Clav, who was a good six inches taller than the guard, and a good deal broader too. Clav looked down at the guard. He couldn't believe his luck. Double or quits? Are you stupid? Clav was about to push past. The guard firmed up and stood his ground something that the guards didn't do a lot of around here. Clavelin was shocked that his uniformed friend didn't budge, and he stopped. You're serious, aren't you? He laughed out of pity. I just want my drinks tokens back, and I know I nearly had you then. Nearly had... What? Look at my cards. They're on the table. You could have had a free pair and still wouldn't have beaten me. Free of a kind, Brent corrected. Don't you get it, Simon? You're not going to beat me, and I'm going to end up with all of your drinks tokens. You have got all of my drinks tokens. So how do you expect to pay double or quits then? Oi, OUs. Fuck off, Simon. Come back when you got something for me to win. 
Simon stood thoughtfully, nodding. Okay then, I will. I'll be back when... when... And he trailed off into the bar area. Unbelievable, Clav said. I have met some stupid people in my time, but he is probably the stupidest. Lucky for me though, he said, waving a healthy wad of drinks tokens in front of his friend's face. Good going, Clav. Brent slapped his pal boisterously on the shoulder. So let's drink then. They set off to the bar. Clav talked about how stupid Simon Hardy was for the entire walk. I wish I'd thought to play him sooner. He's a real mutton for punishment. Glutton, Brent corrected. That's what I said, mutton. He turned to the service droid behind the bar and waved his winnings in the air. Barkeep, two bottles of Cray, over here. Uh, 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 on its way, sir, the droid stammered. Like everything on this planet, it was run down and grit-filled. It juddered and jerked as it moved along the bar on its tracks. My luck has changed, Brent. Big times, Clav explained, slamming the wad of paper down onto the bar. This is f***ing awesome. I'm loving prison this time round. I think I've done the best time of my life so far in here. Brent cringed, his mouth screwing up as those Clav's words were bitter tasted. I don't know, Clav. I've been itching to get out of here. I've been using this time to think about what I need to do to get my life back in order. I think you should think about it too. You don't just want to get out of here and get back in the old swing of life and end up straight back here. No man, you're right, Clav agreed easily, which surprised Brent. We want to try and get into Kramastav. The air is actually breathable there and they've got hot tubs. No, Brent sighed. We don't want to go to Kramastav. Uh, yeah, I think we do, mate. They have better facilities. Yeah, they've got better facilities, but it's still a prison. We don't want to spend our lives in and out of prison, Clav. Speak for yourself, pal. This place is like a holiday. Without prison, I'd have gone insane, what with Lissy and the kids and nagging and chores and problems and prefab payments and the cops constantly trying to throw me back in here, which I don't really mind, but it's usually when I'm in the middle of something. His mind trailed off the track for a minute. Were we in the middle of something when we got arrested? Yeah, avoiding the cops. Brent swooped his drink up when the service droid finally served it. He lugged from the nozzle. He didn't even react to its kick. Well, I can't speak for you, but I wouldn't miss this place. I can't help feeling like a loser stuck in jail when all I ever wanted was to be successful, rich. I got big plans for when I get home. I got big plans too, Clavelin blurted. I just haven't actually thought of them yet. I can't help thinking someone's laughing at me, Brent continued. Someone had picked up my gauntlet and is achieving everything that I ever dreamt of doing, he said solemnly. You just need that lucky break, man. Maybe, but any chance of getting that lucky break isn't in here. It's out there. But I can't wait for that lucky break. We make our own luck. Yeah, and here's one I made earlier, Clavelin said as the Janelti's guard found them at the bar. Well, I couldn't get any more tokens, he began. Looks like that's game over then. Too f***ing bad. No, wait, listen. He brought his cupped hand between him and Clav. We've got this. He opened his hand and both Clav and Brent peered in. His fingers fanned open like obscure curtains to a tiny theatre. Centre stage was a green, crusty, dried out, earthy like organism. What is that? Brent asked, peering in. Clav thought he had a pretty good idea what it was. Let me have a look at that, he said, picking it up. He held it in his fingers, close to his face for inspection. He sniffed it and recognised its musty, earthy smell immediately. It was a flat disc, about a centimetre thick and about an inch wide. One side was dark green and leafy looking. The underside was light brown and clayish. A smile spread from ear to ear. Oh shit, Brent! This is a subternium shroom! A what? Subternium fungus, Simon corrected. It's not actually a mushroom, but it's extremely rare and extremely potent. Even holding it for too long can be dangerous. Its spores seep through your skin and directly into your bloodstream. Clav handed it over to Brent, who looked at it briefly and shrugged. What do you do with it? You can do anything you want with it, Clav explained. Smoke it, eat it, brew it, snort it. It tastes pretty rank though, and it causes all kinds of digestive disorders. But it smokes okay, Simon added, taking the substance back off of Brent. Where in the fuck did you get that, Simon? This stuff is like brick dust. Gold dust, Brent corrected. Mitchell, the guard explained, nodding towards another large, leather-skinned, fuggish guard sat over by the puck shot table, spaced out and vacant. 
His normal mahogany coloured complexion was now a washy grey, his pupils were like saucers and his face was painted with an expression like that you'd find on someone about to be hit by a bus at full pelt being driven by the devil himself. He owed me for a cruiser he bought off me for his little girl. She's learning to fly. Man, he is steaming, Brent exclaimed. All Clav could do was nod in agreement, his smile slicing his face in two. He couldn't wait to be in that depraved state. Simon, my friend, looks like it's game on.